Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. I didn't know it, but I was caught in a smoke out that led from a search for a lady in black, past murder at a highway inn, to gunfire at warehouse, for a girl already dead in the morgue. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. exciting story, The Smoke Out. It never seems to fail. A sleepless night that leaves you with raw nerves and sandpaper eyelids. It's always followed by a day that never ends. A kind of long, tough day that keeps you on the move until life in the city finally reduced to no more than a confused, clatterous sink of exhaust fumes and an aimless mob of shallow people milling around, looking for nothing but a chance to con each other out of a lousy butt. And this was no exception. Because when I finally decided to quit to get out of it to go someplace quiet and relax, I found myself instead in a hurry all over again. I was on my way to a very public building on Spring Street at the stubborn instigation of one Detective Lieutenant Matthews of Homicide whose phone call 20 minutes ago had caught me as soon as I opened my apartment door. Uh, where you been, Marlowe? Don't you ever check in at that office of yours? And on days like this, Matthews, they don't give me a chance. What's up? Tell me all you know about Vera Hamlin, Phil. Who's Vera Hamlin? A girl. No fool. Are you real sure you don't know her? Positive. Am I supposed to? Uh-uh. Maybe she used another name. Pretty blonde, about 5'6", a sweet kid, apparently. I can think of a lot of women who fit that description, Matthews. Yeah, you could. But mm-hmm. this one wrote you a letter yesterday. I didn't get it. Then I haven't been in my office at all today. Why? You wanted your help. How do you know? Well, we picked it up from the imprint in an open pack of stationery in our apartment. Oh? Uh-huh. Better come down and take a look at her, Phil. Take a look at her? Where is she? In the morgue. Oh. She was struck by a car last night. Accident? What makes you ask that, Marlow? Your dubious tone of voice, Matthews. Well, was it an accident? Uh, I guess so. Maybe I've been a cop too long. I get suspicious myself on dark nights. I can understand it. Come on down, Phil. Right away, I'll meet you there. You better hold it a lot of people coming. Oh, here he is now. Hello, Phil. Hi. Made good time. This is Mr. Connor, the morgue attendant. I'm certainly glad to know you, Mr. Marlowe. Is this your first visit? No, I've been here before, Connor. Well, Matthews, for what good do you think this is going to do to the police department? Let's see her and get it over with. All right, let's go, Connor. Certainly. Uh, Step this way, please, gentlemen. Uh, Follow me. Happy fellow is me. Well, civil thanks. Here, to the right. Now, let's see. Egram, Barnegan. Now, here we are. Hamlin, Zero. There. Well, Marlowe? Mm. You know her, Marlowe? No. Okay, that's all. All right, Lieutenant Matthews. Come on, come on, get out of here. Yeah. Now, look, Matthews, I told you on the phone I didn't know. What'd you get me down here because for? Because there are some angles on this death I don't like to look That letter to you is one of them. Got the letter? No. No, I read the whole thing in from the lab and that imprint they worked on. She was worried. She wanted you to investigate something for her. You were supposed to call her today. Know anything about her? Yeah, she came to L.A. about six months ago from Omaha. Mm-hmm. She worked for a guy named Brasso, a produce wholesaler, 77 Market Street. Lately, she was seeing a lot of him after office hours. What's wrong with that? Nothing. But she was killed in front of Brasso's house at 2 a.m. as she was getting out of her car, and Brasso wasn't home at the time. Oh? He has a fair alibi. Puts him out on Highway 101 north of Santa Monica. Hey, excuse happens. me, gentlemen. I'd better get the phone. Yeah, yeah, do it. Yeah, what about the motives, Matthew? No motives. Well, then why are you so upset? What do you, why was she so upset? What did she want you for? That's not enough for you to If I had on. that one answered, I'd know where oh, to go from there. I know, but you're pinning yeah, a murder rap on somebody. What do you mean murder rap? I'm not upset. Uh, it's for you, no. All right, thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Hello, this is Matthew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A witness. Says it was murder. Still get a load of this. Why? Yeah, give me that again. Yeah, a woman. Saw it happen, huh? Great. Who was it? The lady in black. Where'd you get that? It sounds corny. Where did you get that? It sounds... What? 
You mean it's a story about an out now in the L.A. Journal? Yeah. I'll be back there in five minutes. And listen, get a hold of the reporter who wrote that story and hang on to him. I want to talk to that wise punk. How do you like that? How do you like yeah, it? Yeah, Vera Hamlin murdered with an eyewitness to prove it. Only the police department is the last outfit in town to know. Come on, Phil. Where to this time? To buy a newspaper. Find out what's going on. <laughs> One stop on the way to pick up a copy of the journal which he read as I drove. The kind of smoky, well illustrated sensationalism that caused issues, double police work, and false papers. exclusively to the journal tonight that she was an eyewitness when a mad killer purposely swerved his speeding car into curvaceous blonde beauty Vera Hamlin outside her lover's Brentwood home late last night. If that's journalism, I'll eat my bag. Keep reading, you're a cop, not a critic. Yeah, but I got taste. The lady in black will appear at police headquarters at 9 o'clock to reveal license number and description of the murder and the shocking death which police have already labeled accidental nuts. Come on, Mullen. I thought I was sorry for Matthews because the way things were breaking, the Vera Hamlin deal was a cinch to become one of those involved screwball affairs. But nothing goes according to the book, and I was glad I never got a letter. Now it was none of my business. All I wanted to do was drop Matthews off, get away from the whole thing, and try to forget about it. But when we piled up behind the waiting squad car at headquarters, a gang of night beat photographers draping the stairs. Stop it. Don't give you a fright. Lieutenant, is your witness going to show? It's nine on the button. Where's the lady in How do I know? I didn't find out there was a witness till I read it in the journal. Yeah, that was a dirty trick. Hiya, my lord. Hi, Abbott. You're an old-timer, Abbott. You guys ought to keep punks like the journals squirt in line. They just make it tough on everybody. Oh, don't blame us for that guy. He's burned up, huh, Marla? You blame him? You know as well as I do, the journal picked up that witness right here. Kept her under wraps until they had time to break the story. Well, he shouldn't let it throw him. You know, guys like that usually hang them. Sure, short. after the damage is done. Now I've had enough today, Matthews. Besides, nobody in City Hall signs my check. Good night. Bud, you ended up in a 
that's not all either. I know why he's hanging around out here. Also, why it ain't going to do him one bit of good. I got plenty to tell him. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah. That's Monty Stipple who opened the door to number four here. I got to get out of here. But I got plenty to tell, bud. So when you're finished in there, come on over behind the grease rack at the filling station. I'll be waiting for you. I don't know how you feel, Dave. You're on edge. You got reason to be, but running back into town won't help you any. So they got a witness. She's already told it. Wait a minute. There's somebody outside here. Yeah, that's right. I want to see Dave Brasso. Uh, Mr. Brasso is pretty busy right now, mister. Not too busy to see me. Oh, you a uh, cop? No. And you must be a crummy reporter, so scram. Uh, you look Mr. Brasso up at his place of business some other time. You mean after he skipped town to keep the witness from putting a finger on him? Why, you Hold snooping. Hold Wait. Who are you? What's your dive, soldier? Name's Marlowe, private detective. I'm here because Vera Hamlin wrote me a letter yesterday. Vera? Monty, get lost for a couple of minutes, will you? I want to talk to this guy. Don't you go think on, you better go let on, me... beat it. Well, okay. All right, soldier. Come on in. You wanted to see me? I'll take a good look. Well? Okay, so you're big, Brasson. Husky enough to run over somebody and kill him. Without even getting into a car. I'll let that one go by, soldier. Where's the letter? Locked up in my office. What'd she say in it? She wanted something to look into and said this was a good place to start. Uh, jealous of a fool. Is that what the fight was about last time? Fight? You do find things out, don't you, soldier? That's my business. Well, maybe you know who this lady in black here in the paper is and what she's going to tell. Maybe. Might even know who was jumping up to try to kill her tonight and shut her up. Who is that? You mean somebody... Come on, Brasso. Let's stick closer to the truth. You're a lousy actor. For instance, Vera wanted me to come to this dump because you and Stipple are holed up here. Why? That doesn't concern you. It's business. Sure, and when a girl accidentally gets in the way of business, she's run over by it. Is that the way you work? You keep talking on the same thing, soldier, and I don't like it. I was in love with Vera Hamlin. Maybe you're trying to use that to nail me in a frame. Maybe you're a sneak for that stinking louse weather. Maybe you didn't get any letter from Vera at all, so get out of here and think up a new one. Your theories are getting way ahead of you, Buster. Who's weather? Jerk. I said get out. Oh. I take that back for an answer, soldier, and you can get more of the same anytime you want it at 77 Market Street. That's a hair trigger left with 200 pounds of shoulder behind it. Piled me out of the door and flat on my back in the gravel. Which tallied my interview with him at zero with one minor exception. My spiteful informer Baggett had some basis in fact for his story, so dusted myself off and made for the rear of the deserted filling station where the grease rack stood. There was nobody around. I waited a few minutes for him, and then I skirted wide around the auto court and looked in at the scaly window at the bar. Stipple was there with his nose in a beer glass, but no baggage. I circled the building quietly, found nothing but indignant spiders in dark corners, and decided to try the grease rack again. When the back door to the bar opened, and the moon came out with a flashlight and a pail of garbage. He was halfway to a rack of cans when he froze. Like a bird dog with one foot in the air. Holy mackerel. Splashlight stabbing at a man's hand, hanging out over the edge of a shallow ditch. Look. Look there. There's somebody laying in the ditch. Yeah. No wonder I couldn't find him. It's Baggett with a knife in his back. Continue with the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Smokeout. Even as death quietly hardened the hand at the edge of the ditch, the wheezing, pudgy circle known as Moon was already worrying less about why murder was sprawled at his feet and more about what the violent playing of the truck driver was going to do to his roadhouse business as usual. Didn't make for most of listening. Dave Brasso, that Monday Stipple, all of them. They can take their trade and their troubled summers up. I got to make a buck like the next guy, but I sure ain't going to do it this way. Well, overnight, it's just... Hey, wait a minute, Moon. What troubles are you talking about? Brasso and Stipple, I mean. What is it? Come on, speak up. It may be important. 
To who? To me and the law. And to bag it here. Maybe a girl who died a little ahead of her time. A girl who what? Hey, mister, you're talking in circles. Yeah, sure I am. And we don't have time for that, do we, Moon? Here, let go of me. Are you going to talk? Well? Okay, okay, I'll tell you. There's no international secret. Now, get your hands off of me. All right, we'll make it fast. The setup, what is it, Moon? Too much competition. Another produce outfit run by a guy named Mike... Uh, he, he's been picking Brasso's trucks off along U.S. 101 every other night. Sometimes it's a well-planned accident, and sometimes just sloppy hijacking, but all this is trouble. Trouble Brasso can't prove, is that it? Yes. That's the reason for Monday Stipples and the meetings out here. Stipples supposed to get the proof for hey, Brasso. There's a guy going to the car next to mine. Oh, that's Brasso, Marlowe. And like I said, I've had enough. For my dough, it's time to call the cops. Good luck, sucker. Dave Brasso was out in front by no more than 30 seconds So as I ran toward my car in the wall of dust as high as it kicked up I figured I had an even chance of catching up with him Before he got back to Santa Monica and into heavy traffic But I figured differently when I had one hand on the door of my car I had to, company said so I'm holding a gun, please don't move She was standing someplace behind me And when I did as told, she moved around in a wide, careful arc Until we faced each other across a chunk of dark night It revealed only two things one, she was holding a gun, and two, there was no mistaking her. This was a lady in black. Those car keys there in your hand. Throw them here, please. Now, wait a minute. I'm sure we can talk... Please, let me have them. Okay. Now what? Now, whoever you are, you can look for these when I'm hey, gone. Hey, listen. I don't want to be interfered with. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You're afraid something will jar the sale price you've set for Brasso, huh? Yeah. What are you talking about? That ever sneaking routine known as blackmail. But to be very specific, a mystery witness, you, the lady in black, who almost gets to the police to take a killer. Almost so she could scare said killer into Jenna's frame of mind when next they meet. In other words, baby, it was all an act of pressure play on Dave Brasso. Now it's time to collect. Do I go on? No, you don't. You just do as I say. You just turn around and walk. And think a little. Think about the pistol shots that you neglected to mention, which somebody took at me while I almost went to the police. Or did I do that myself? Also for the sake of Mr. Brasso's frame of mind. It's possible. I don't think so. Now go and start walking. You don't make much sense standing here. As I moved away from her, she backed off quickly toward a car that was nuzzling a high hitch near the far side of the roadhouse. So I knew that any move I intended to make had to be done right then and there. But she must have known just as much because that was when the gun she held got mad enough to start spitting my way. I dove to the gravel at my feet, then practically burrowed my way across a dozen uncomfortable yards of chopped rock to the shoulder of a line of trash cans. All of which left me scarred, safe, and in time to do nothing more effective than swear. I had a pair of teasing tail lights on a green sedan that were already winking out of sight. Didn't help much. Well, what do you know? The private detective again. Well, what's it this time? Bill Brasso Stipple is he in? No, he isn't. That's funny. No, I don't think so. I only think you're funny. The panic, Marlowe. Uh, Moon and I have been watching you comb that gravel out there searching for the key. We couldn't catch the chatter, but she certainly made you look stupid. And just so you don't go on looking that way, don't bother playing so wide-eyed about Brasso being in here either. You see, I know you know he isn't. <laughs> it won't work, sonny boy. Maybe a little pressure will. Um, I doubt it. I don't bend easy, Marlowe. Also, I don't happen to know where Brasso went. But just so nobody gets too upset or quick with a gun, maybe we have to go back over to the bar to chat. Mm -hmm. Moon's expecting me. Besides, it's cozier there. It won't be once the cops start pouring in. Incidentally, it makes it your turn not to play dumb. Huh? I mean Ernie Baggett being very dead out in the back. <laughs> Even Stephen. Am I Marlowe? Yeah. Okay. I know about Baggett. From Brasso? I said... I heard you. <sighs> nice night. Hmm, Marlo? You know, Stipple, you're making a big mistake. Hmm? Why? Protecting Brasso can't pay off anymore. Well, you said I was protecting him. I worked for Dave Brasso, period. If he knocked off a couple of people, and I'm not saying he has, it's got nothing to do with me. What's done is done. Which doesn't include the girl, huh? Who? That witness? What's the difference? What happens to her? She's living on borrowed time right now, anyway, look at her. Why? Because of what she knows? No, no. Because of the way she handles what she knows. All that gab in the papers. 
Oh, well, she's lucky those three shots that were thrown at her only came out of a pistol. Could have been a howitzer, considering the advance notice she gave. Hey, Moon. What? The cops here yet? No, they ain't. I rode with those in five minutes, ten minutes ago. I sure wish they'd get here. <laughs> well, don't worry, they will. Tell them all over the beach. Hey. Hey, private detective. Come out of it. What's up? Around here, simple nothing. Nothing at all. Where are you going? To 77 Market Street. The Brothel Produce Company. I think it's where both your boss and the lady in black are going to get together. And what gives you that idea? A hunch, Stipple. Just a hunch. Goodbye. The Brothel Produce Company was a half a block of corrugated metal warehouse crushed behind a wide loading ramp which at 2 a.m. bustled with enough noisy, fresh vegetable business to turn night as the day. And when I was out of my car, clear of the whirling electric hand hey, car, I got to keep my way in between fatted lettuce crates toward a cage marked dispatcher. I kept wondering how a guy who built an outfit like this single-handed could have possibly made the mistake I figured was his. I stopped wondering when a face that had been stolen from a hawk pressed itself close to the inside of the cage and yelled at me. Well, what is it, mister? Talk up there. Well, I'm busy here. Hey, Twenty-one up bushel, right? Brothel's not in his office, Miss I'm not sure where he is. I'm not sure. You are cop. Now, private detective, with express account, will five help? He just paid ten. Oh, let it ring. Come on, Buster, this counts. Here's ten. The lady in black. Yeah, yeah, keep it down, will you? She stood around for maybe twenty minutes before she got talking to me. Not a bad-looking doll. All right, right, all right. Now, where'd you send her? Come on, you got your ten talk. Hang on just a minute. Where? The old shed in the back. Used to be a warehouse. They've got a real private office there. You'll probably catch up there if you run. I'll probably try. Thanks. The ex-warehouse turned out to be an ugly huddle of parched cobbler teetering at the edge of a deserted cobblestone alley. And quietly dying of old age. And except for a flicker of light from an open door deep inside, it was as dark and as quiet as the lining of a frock coat. So I stepped in, and in front of a gun, it was no surprise. When I told you that I didn't want to be interfered with, I meant just that. Now, without shouting, who are you? For one thing, a private detective named Philip Marlowe. Another a guy who's still working for Vera Hamlin. You, you were working for Vera? That's right, but not swinging in the dark. Which means what? That you never saw Vera Hamlin killed in the first place. And that all this lady in black razzle-dazzle strictly a smokeout. Vera was my sister, Marlowe. Her letters told me all about Dave Brasso. About what he meant to her. About the runaround she was getting from him. So you added that to a phony hit-and-run accident and decided to pose as a surprise witness. So that Dave Brasso would try to pick you off and reveal himself as your sister's killer. If you live through it. Right. And now, Marlo, you'd... Marlo, quick. Get back. Brasso just turned that light off in there. He's coming out. And I'm going to meet him. No, don't. Look, listen. If you want to help stay where you are, keep quiet. Oh, brother. I'd better be right. She moved one slow step at a time toward the long, thin triangle of light the open warehouse door spilled across the sawdust flooring. I slid my 38 from shoulder host to the right hand and the hair on the back of my neck started to crawl. And suddenly there was nothing to do but wait. You can stop right there, Mr. Brasso. Huh? Who's there? Who are you? A girl named Hamlin, Mr. Brasso. Friends with Hamlin. A girl who knows all about how my sister really is. It was only a sudden flash of light, but the gnome's taking it. It was a pistol raised and aimed at the back of Francis Hamlin's head. It was all the cue I needed. Drop it! Step up! Yeah, but he's harmless, honey. He and Stipple aren't on the same team as far as your sister's concerned. Did you hear that, Brasso? Yeah, I heard you, Marlo. Well, then, then Stipple killed my sister. Why, Marlo? I don't know. He's the one to ask about that. All right. Why, Stipple? Dave, why did you do it? Dave, stay back. Why? I, just... uh, I did it because she caught me on my place, caught me talking to Mike Weber. You worked for Weber for the guy who was wrecking our business? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Dave, please, I didn't know what I was doing. She was going back to you to tell you what she saw. You oh, no. You'd be double-crossing her. Oh, Dave, no. Dave, that's enough. No, no, it isn't. Please, Dave. I've got something to finish. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm 
on the city payroll? You did all right tonight. Hey, Miss Duck, hey, where Duck Matthews. Uh oh, hey, hey, Lieutenant, how about the story? We're pushing our deadline on a bulldog at this. Yeah, yeah, we work for daily papers, Matthews. You've been holed up in that warehouse with Marlowe and that heavy for a half hour now. What is? Hey, how bad is Sipple's wound? Look, the wound is nothing. It's a scratch, although I wouldn't say he ain't hurt. But the story will have to wait until I'm down at headquarters. I haven't got it all myself. Oh, oh Lieutenant, oh, you're kidding. Sure, I got lots of time for it. Listen, Abbott. Monty Stipple killed both Vera Hamlin and Ernie Baggett. Got killed it. the lady because she found that he was crooked, and he killed Baggett because he was afraid Baggett knew too much. Okay. Now, so long. Oh, but Lieutenant, tonight I got something less than love for the gentleman of the press. Hey, Phil, oh, come on. Miss Hamlin's over there. All right. Now, look, Marlo, before it's impossible for me to stay away from those dear boys any longer, tell me, where did you run across the switch? I mean, what the heck must Stipple for? The mistake he made, Lieutenant, calling the shots when he was blindfolded. Or in other words, what? Matthews, I'm tired. Tomorrow, huh? No, 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 we can no, talk no, then. No, Come on, Frank. Oh, please. Okay. Well, it's something like this. Back at Moon's Point, Sybil yeah. told me how lucky the lady in black was. Only three shots were thrown at him. And he had no way of knowing how many shots had been thrown, huh? Had a boy. Unless, of course, he threw them himself. Sure. Francis had a smoke-out plan, which was an inspiration to me because... Knowing Sipple was a liar and proving it were two different things. So you led him to the warehouse, and while Miss Hamlin here gunned for Brussels, Sipple gunned for her. You're so right, and good night, Lieutenant Oh, no, Matthew. no, listen, Marlowe, I good got... Good night, you. Lieutenant. Okay, okay, good night, Phil. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Lieutenant. Thanks, Marlowe. And... And what? More questions? Uh-huh. But not under vital statistics. Oh. Uh, Marlowe... One way or another, my crazy plan has worked, right? I guess so. Well, then tell me. Now that Stipple's caught and well, it's all over, am I supposed to feel good? I don't know, baby. Maybe that's what's so screwy about revenge. It's got all the permanence of a smoke ring, even when your positive is justified. Cigarette. <laughs> Dog tired when it started. Whipped. Fed up with the city and the aimless, milling mob of shallow people. Always hungry for a buck that made it move. But now, as I drove through the quiet, empty downtown streets and listened to Francis Hamilton talk about her sister, who had never been anything but nice, I stopped thinking about those money grubbers and thought instead about the ones like Vera. All the people all over the world who sometimes get in trouble because other people won't realize the world is not for sale. Yeah. The Vera's are the ones to keep in mind. And that was when I decided that I was only tired, not whipped, not fed up. All I needed was a good night's sleep. So I went home and got it. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Barney Phillips, John Daner, Jack Crucian, Polly Bear, Edgar Barrier, Byron Kane, Hugh Thomas, and Bill Lally. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. <laughs> Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says...